With my first solar air heater installed and producing real heat, I wanted to quickly install another and double the BTUs I'm bringing in. At the same time, this is largely a learning experience, so I figured, let's tweak the design and see if I can make it even better. In this seventh video, we will cover maximizing heat transfer, the relationship between temperature rise and cubic feet per minute, how to minimize heat loss, we're going to review what energy is available to us from the sun, the benefits of turbulent air, the differences between my 2017 design and the 2021 installation, and alterations made to better distribute airflow and improve conduction, and finally the efficiencies gained. When we're talking about making an existing design better, it's not about producing more heat. It's about maximizing the heat transfer to collect as much heat as possible. It's about building a better heat exchanger. The average intensity of solar energy reaching us is about 1360 watts per square meter. We can't change that. We could build a larger collector, but that's not what I'm talking about here. In this video, video 7, I'm talking about building a better heat exchanger, maximizing the heat transferred from the sun to air within a given space. The three types of heat transfer are convection, conduction, and radiation. Solar air heating systems use air as the working fluid for absorbing and transferring solar energy. Transferring heat from one place to another, by definition, is a heat exchanger. When the sun heats the metal, the hot metal heats the air circulating over the metal of the heat exchanger. The absorber material within my solar air collector is aluminum pop cans. The job is to capture radiation from the sun and transfer this thermal energy to air via conduction heat transfer. So when I'm talking about making my existing design better, I'm really saying I want to enhance conduction. Before I explain exactly what I'm planning on doing, I need to share a few facts that are frequently overlooked. Heat output depends on the rise in temperature and the airflow. Many of the videos on YouTube talk only about temperature rise as though that is all that mattered, when in fact it's only half the story. It's easy to create a solar air collector with a large temperature rise and have a low heat output because the airflow is much too low. My first design back in 2017, shown working in the beginning of video 6 of this series, was a perfect case in point. It was heating air to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. I used 153 internal aluminum baffles to ensure tremendous conduction. The problem was, I had used so many baffles that it was physically impossible to move air through the unit. There's also a tendency to think that baffles or dividers or anything that increases the collector temperature rise will improve the efficiency of the collector but generally the most efficient collectors will have a temperature rise just enough to be used for space heating and an airflow that is relatively large. The reason for this goes back to that portion of the heat that the absorber takes in that ends up being lost out the collector's glass or plexiglass. You want to minimize heat loss through the glass. An important way to do that is to keep the absorber temperature as low as usably possible. The cooler the absorber runs, the less heat will be lost out of the glass. A way to keep the absorber cooler while extracting the same amount of energy from the sun is to increase the airflow. So that's a lot to take in. My second design, and the first unit I installed on the building, was the polar opposite. Nine wide open solar air tubes with no baffles and excellent airflow. We know from the points just made a moment ago that this unit is more efficient than the first as significantly less heat within the absorber is lost out of the collector's glass. The only piece that is in question is am I maximizing the conduction heat transfer. Let's assume for a minute that my first solar air heater is exactly one meter square and is 100% efficient. It isn't. But for the purpose of this discussion, let's assume those dimensions and 100% efficiency. So, I am capturing exactly 1360 watts, or 
4,638 BTUs from the Sun. When calculating BTUs or watts within a solar air heater, there are really only two variables, air flow, or cubic feet per minute, and temperature differential, or temperature rise. Let's go back to our formula. My one meter square, 100% efficient solar air heater has a temperature rise of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, while moving 86 cubic feet per minute of air capturing 4,638 BTUs or 1,360 watts of solar energy. If I want to use a stronger fan and move 100 cubic feet per minute of air through the same 100% efficient solar air unit, I know mathematically that my temperature will drop from 50 degrees to 13. Why? Because we can't generate more energy than what the sun can provide. All that is available is 1360 watts. If you increase the airflow, you decrease the temperature rise. If you increase the temperature rise, you decrease the airflow. Now that we understand the relationship between these two variables, let's come back to reality. My solar air heater is not 100% efficient. I may only be getting 1000 or 900 watts per square meter due to poor conduction heat transfer. My first design with 153 aluminum baffles had fantastic conduction but almost zero airflow. The second unit has no baffles or restrictions, good airflow, but likely not the best conduction heat transfer. Everything I have read suggests turbulent air will improve conduction heat transfer. So let's take that as a given. We know that a turbulent flow accelerates heat conduction and thermal mixing. However, a turbulent flow also increases the amount of air resistance and noise. In this application, noise is not my concern. But from the reasons I've described here, I don't want to impact airflow. So how do we improve conduction without significantly reducing airflow? One of the ideas that came to me while I was thinking about this problem was the bore of a rifle. It is grooved, which puts a spiral spin on the bullet for greater accuracy. If we had something similar on the inside of our solar air heaters, we would be forcing the air to come in contact with the sides of the tube, improving conduction, while not restricting airflow. I don't plan on testing this theory, as I don't have the time or the resources, but I wanted to share the idea with others. There are so many factors that need to be taken into consideration, like the conductivity of the material, the thickness of the material, and the area of the material. Different materials have greater or lesser resistance to heat transfer. Make them better insulators or better conductors. Lots to take in here. And remember, I'm working with pop cans. Here's a quick rendering of the unit I currently have installed. 153 pop cans painted in heat resistant flat black paint behind 1 8 inch plexiglass. If you remove the glass and paint, you can clearly see the placement of the intake and exhaust manifold. 5 inch ductwork feeding 9 unobstructed solar air tubes with 1 and 3 quarter inch openings. Or 19.6 square inches of duct feeding 21.6 square inches of solar air tubes. Let's revisit the internal differences between my 2017 design and my 2021 installation. Both pop cans have their tops removed. The pop can on the left has a 1 and 3 quarter inch diameter hole cut in the bottom of the can. I have 153 of these cans in my 2021 installation, and it's working well. The second can, with four holes punched in the base, is my 2017 design. If you watch the beginning of video 6 in this series, you'll see this unit produces 160 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. It was made using these four hole cans. The unit demonstrated fantastic conduction, but minimal airflow. Hot to the touch, but otherwise useless. For illustration purposes, I'm going to paint the four hole can dark gray, so it can be easily identified in my next rendering. So, in my third design, I'm going to alter the use of my original baffle design to improve airflow, while maintaining good conduction. I'm going to do this by disturbing the airflow within the solar air tubes, while trying to minimize airflow obstructions. 
The placement and quantity of these baffles will also be used to better balance and distribute air more evenly across all nine solar air tubes. The center three solar air tubes will receive two baffles. Starting at the bottom, the first baffle will be located in the second can, with the intention of disturbing the airflow early. The second baffle will be located in the tenth can. They are depicted here in dark gray. The next four solar tubes, two on each side of the center three, will receive just one baffle, located in can nine. We're using just one here as the air entering these chambers will already be more turbulent than the air entering the three tubes in direct alignment with the intake and exhaust manifolds. Finally, the two outer solar air tubes, furthest from the intake and exhaust manifold, will remain wide open and unobstructed. So, did this new tweaked design make a difference? I'm almost reluctant to share my findings because I'm having problems believing them. This new design appears to capture not 5 or 10% more energy from the sun, but 74% more. Really? How is that even possible? Well, first off, I don't trust my anemometer. It's a cheap unit with shot bearings, and I know from previous calibrated tests it reads low. However, knowing that it is reading low, I'm going to make the huge assumption that the tool is still useful for comparing relative airflow between the two solar air units. If it reads 20% low on one unit, I'm assuming, big assumption, it'll also read 20% low on the second. I know this logic is flawed. As an example, perhaps with the lower airflow, the wind isn't strong enough to overcome the shot bearings, and with more wind, there's less resistance. This is a real possibility. So what numbers did I get? Well, the first unit has one 16-watt fan installed. In the second unit, I installed two 16-watt fans one blowing air into the chamber and one sucking air out. I used two fans on the second unit as I wanted to overcome the additional internal airflow resistance built into the design. Because of the additional resistance, I knew in advance that adding a second fan was not going to double the airflow. The first unit, according to my anemometer with the shot bearings, measured 64 cubic feet per minute. The second unit measured 107 cubic feet per minute, or 67% more airflow. Whether both numbers are low or not, I'm not that uncomfortable with the differences between the two. I would have guessed similar differences based on the internal design differences of the two units, as well as what the air feels like when you're holding your hands in front of the units. Okay, knowing the relationship between cubic feet per minute and temperature rise, clearly the second unit, with its increased airflow, is going to be running cooler. Nope. Even with the increased cubic feet per minute, 
Unit number two is running slightly warmer. Wow. Here are the real numbers. These numbers capture a moment in time. I can't recall where the sun was when I took these readings, and it really doesn't matter, as I'm not trying to demonstrate best case scenario, but rather do a direct comparison between design number one and design number two. The first design measured 64 cubic feet per minute of air while maintaining a 49.86 temperature rise, capturing 1,011 watts. I used 16 watts to do so, so the watts gained is 995. The second design measured 107 cubic feet per minute of airflow while maintaining 52.02 temperature rise capturing 1,763 watts. I used two 16-watt fans to do so, so the watts gained is 1,731, or 74% more efficient than design number one. I have a problem believing these numbers. I was expecting 15 or maybe 20% more energy. In the end, the numbers mean little. The anemometer could be wrong. The temperature gun might be inaccurate. But both instruments were used on both solar air heaters at the same moment in time. An instrument or no instrument, the second design moves more air at the same or warmer temperature. It is a dramatic improvement in conduction. Oh, is that nice? <laughs> <sighs> this is the last that you're going to hear from me on this subject as I have another project in the wings that I'm uh, just getting ready to bite into. I do want to take a moment and thank everyone for your feedback and support over the last few years as I've been working through this project. Also, I'm really interested in hearing how others are making out using alternative materials for conduction. Cheers.